squat, scorn. This video is sponsored by Squarespace, the number one place to make a website that is effortlessly beautiful as Antoine Dupont on the cover of GQ. Scorn, right. Some might say it's the fact they capped Kelly Harmona, but I think the most damning thing about Italian rugby is thus. If you were to ask every single person watching this video, what are the first three images that come to mind when you think of Italian rugby? The same few things would come to mind for almost everyone. Sergio Parise metaphorically flexing as he carried his team on his back. Martin Castrogiovanni being as flagrant For me, San Valentine's just every day. As he was fearsome at scrum time. And then the third one's a bit of a wild card. We're talking Diego Dominguez slickly slotting goals. Mirko Bergamasco passionately fluking goals. Or Maro Bergamasco not even fluking passes. The last 25 years of Italian rugby have been built on memories of what came before. Reputations matter more than form. It's rare to find a legend of Italian rugby who never tainted their legacy by playing too long or in the halfbacks. Italian rugby has almost always been about looking backwards. Until now. For better or worse, I think this is all about to change because whilst they remain favourites to take a 17th wooden spoon, putting them just eight behind Ireland for the record, everything is already in motion to see a shift in Italian rugby, unlike anything the team has seen since they joined the Six Nations in the year 2000. So, what can we expect from Kieran Crowley's new team in 2022, and why is anybody offering the same old kicking the out of the Six Nations, woo, patter, just a boring old hack this year? Rugby's greatest championship doesn't let just anyone in. But enough about MLR franchise spots, the Six Nations is also tricky to get into. Over the last 139 years, the oldest competition in the overlist sport has only let in newcomers twice, once for France in 1910, and once more 90 years later when they added Italy and left Scotland as the eternal Five Nations champions. Italy joined the tournament in the year 2000, and the replacing with Georgia hacks have been trying to kick them out ever since. However, not many know the extent to which former Georgia captain Mamuku Gugodze has been trying to do this ever Ever since. Gugodze was just 16 on New Year's Eve 1999, and at the time was convinced the Millennium Bug would wipe out the Italian rugby website and with it end their chances of joining the Six Nations and allow his country to take their place instead. However, seeing as their current modern website is too advanced, Gugodze, in order to do this now, has no choice but to try and recreate the creaky old 1999 version himself. So in order to do this, he went to Squarespace. However, try though he might to make it ugly, Gogodze found it so alarmingly simple to create a beautiful, functional, and incredibly practical, wonderful website. He just got carried away. Instead of building a website to wipe out Italian rugby, he used their drag and drop features to construct one so stunning. It's sure to secure their places in the competition for decades. And if you want to be like Gogodze, you can follow the link in the description to Squarespace and use the offer code SquidRugby to get 20% off your own gorgeous website. That one's a bit of a stretch. But seeing as um, none of that ever happened, Italy were able to instead consummate their place in the Six Nations for win over the defending champions in their very first game, only for things from there to arguably kind of, you know, yeah, start to stale. 12 wins in 22 years isn't the proudest of records, and if you get your opinions from nothing more than facts, things are only getting worse. 2021's Italy were, on aggregate, according to facts, the worst team the championship has ever seen. The 239 points conceded was a record across 100 39 years. In reaction, coach Franco Smith was moved upstairs into a senior position at the Italian Rugby Union, the kind of way you tell a kid their cat has gone to live in the attic after it gets hit by 239 trucks. And yet, without wanting to sound like Henry Slade reading a medical document, sometimes it's good to trust vibes instead of just straight facts. Because last year's Six Nations was the first time for some time it felt Italy were truly starting to look forwards. Let's go back to the start of this. Following an average 2015 World Cup, Italy appointed then Harlequins director of rugby, Conor O'Shea, to the top job. And whilst there were sparks of hope on the field, with O'Shea leading the team to their first ever win over the Springboks, the real legacy of his work came underneath the national team. Upon arriving, O'Shea assessed what he inherited and decided rugby in Italy needed a huge overhaul. Where his predecessors had focused on damage limitation and dreamt of one day maybe finishing fifth, O'Shea decided instead to focus long term and dare to dream of building a world where Italy might one day win the Six Nations. And so, one of O'Shea's first acts was to poach fellow Irishman Steve Abood to be Italy's head of technical direction. Abood was an IRFU employee for over 20 years, but when he was promoted to the same job in Ireland in 2009, he overhauled the entire academy system on the Emerald Isle, and the results started to show. Amidst fears of a retiring golden generation, a booed system started to take effect. As each of those players retired, natural replacements flooded through, world-class youngsters being produced by provinces almost every single year, leading us to the world now where Ireland are producing so 
many pointlessly, wonderfully high quality back row as Scott Penny remains uncapped, and I can't remember the name of all the world class back three lads at Leinster. It took about six years for Abu's academy work to filter up to the Six Nations in Ireland, and 2022 marks his sixth year in Italy, with the results really starting to show underneath the national team. If we're to go entirely off facts, the three best under 20 teams Italy have ever produced were 2018, 2020 and 2021. And if you look at Italy's under 20 points difference in the Six Nations, since the year O'Shea and Abood came aboard, other than one outlier in 2019, it improves every single year until last year, Italy finished with a positive points difference for the first time ever. And that only happens when you start winning games. Over the last six years, at under-20 level, Italy have beaten Scotland five times, Wales and Ireland twice each, Argentina once, and finished within three points of France three times, and England twice. In fact, the swing is so big, a 15-point loss to Wales last year was their biggest losing margin for three years, right? In that time, the All Blacks have lost by 15 or more points twice. But if you think the under-20s are good already, if you think that's impressive, just get ready. Because things get even better when you go down a grade. Whilst the world woke up to Italy's potential with an 18s win, powered by Paolo beating England, their results have only got better since. Last year, Italy under 18s played all five of the other nations. They beat four. We are now at a point for Italy's age grade sides where their biggest margins in the Six Nations at under 18s level are their wins, not their losses. 21 points over Wales, 31 points over Ireland, and 10 points over England, all bigger than their eight point loss to France. The first of those players filtered into the national team about 14 months ago, as first caps were handed out to the likes of Michele Lamoro, Paolo Garbisi, Federico Mori, Stephen Varney, Nicola Canone, Gianmarco Lucchese, players who could make up the spine of the Italian team for some time to come. Only two of those players I listed were born when Italy made their debut in the Six Nations. Of course, none of this means anything if they don't have a coach who can get the most out of them, and they have a new one ready to do just that. With Smith rage crying his way into the attic, in his place comes Kieran Crowley, a man who looks a bit like what would happen if you ordered Joe Schmidt off Wish. Kiwi Crowley made his name as the coach who brought Canada to the greatest heights they've managed in the professional era over a six-year stint in the Great White North. They won two games in the 2011 World Cup, beating Tonga and Japan, and whilst 2015 was not as successful, they did push Italy very hard, at one point leading 10-0, thanks to this absolutely stunning, beautiful try, finished in the end by DTH van der Merwe. What, what a try. And they eventually only lost that game by five points, a 41-point better margin than Crowley's successor, Kingsley Jones, would manage in 2019. This performance must have endeared him to the Italians as he joined Benetton as the head coach just a year later, where he remained in the job for another six seasons. In that time, he took them to their first ever quarter-final and a few unexpectedly respectable finishers before last year pulling off Le Coup de... El Coup de... Le Coup de... Is the Coup de Gras... Does that work in Italian? Is that Italian? Uh, whatever it is. As Benetton took home the most prestigious trophy in all of rugby, the best trophy, the one... Your favourite is my favourite. It's all of our favourite. The Rainbow Cup. Italy have played three games already under the new boss, and there was an instant uptick in their defence. Italy were the team who kept the All Blacks scoreless for the longest in 2021, I know, and whilst a lot of that was down to an inspired performance by a new captain and man who it would be impossible to tell apart from a Jim Henson puppet version of him, Michele Lamoureux, Italy did strut out a different defence to earlier in the year. Whereas their system from the Six Nations was a shit version of South Africa's, in the autumn they employed a functional version of the Crusader system, which is designed to bend but never break. In this situation a year ago, Federico Mori would have been encouraged to shoot out a line here, hit bridge, meaning quick hands but Braden they're not away with just the fullback to beat. Instead, Mori backtracks and cuts off the ball carrier's options, trusting his inside defence to catch up and make the tackle. We see a great example of this here. Mori allows McKenzie to get on the other side of him, knowing he's only drifting towards the touchline. Brex makes the chop tackle, and Italy reorganise instantly. They then proceed to run some superb defence, with Brex popping up once again here to make a great shot. Italy in the autumn regularly flooded this channel aggressively to prevent the ball going out the back, and it works here brilliantly. Whilst New Zealand do get on the outside of them a few times, most of the ground is invariably lost again in the middle thanks to this angry mid-rush. Italy just remain composed in this pattern for 17 full phases before Lamro sweeps in with his muppety arms to take the turnover. Italy conceded 12 tries this autumn, but if we look at them, it's six from set pieces inside five metres of the line, four mauls and two scrums, two tries from lucky bouncers, both for Argentina, and this from Minotti simply being beaten in the air. It's kind of an anomaly. That leaves just two moments 
where the All Blacks and one more Argentina actually broke down their defence. However, when it comes to them actually scoring tries, actually using the ball, things might look objectively a bit more rosy. You don't kind of have to allow qualifiers there. Crowley recently said they entered the autumn without a hard and fast game plan with the ball because he wanted to assess the squad and get to know them in order to tailor an attack to the team. As such, it's hard to know how Italy are going to exactly approach this Six Nations, but there are clues to be found not only in autumn performances, but also his time with other teams. Whilst the game has changed too far to take much from how his Canada team played, there's one thing that links all Kieran Crowley teams, and that's a lack of kicking as a tactic. Though Crowley's Benetton, Canada and Italy so far do kick, they tend to leave it up to individual instinct, not baking the boot into the game plan. There's none of the South Africa style desire to exit each zone to always move forward, not even an All Black style hoof it to disorganise the defence tactic. If we look at any example, they're all when space opens up naturally. Here, the Bulls notice Benetton never kick off first base, so bring the winger up flat so Garbizi can dink it in behind. An awful lot of the kicking in the autumn came not from Garbizi or Varney at halfback, but Ignacio Brex in the centre, spotting openings as defence adapted to Paolo playing wide. But the wonderful thing about Paolo is he adapts back. Now, regulars on this channel know I bang on about Paolo Garbizi. You know, a. Uh, 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 I've done it before, but I do it with good reason because I genuinely believe this guy could retire the bet. And this is a lot of hard to put on him. I recognise that, and I apologise for that. But you know, it's, um, it's, it's how I feel. I do believe he could retire the best player to ever pull on an Italian jersey. Now, Garbisi is one of those fly-offs like George Ford, Richie Mwanga, or Gareth Anscom, where I think it's easy to tell they are good, but hard to identify why. You know, to list it. The casual viewer spots they're always involved in the best passages the team runs, but don't necessarily know what exactly. Exactly it is they're doing. Moments such as this wonder try on debut or this lovely offload to Johan Meyer, both against Ireland and both leading to seven points, are easy to spot, but the strongest aspects of Garbizi's game is the shape he brings and creates in attack by managing everything. Check this play from the Rainbow Cup final. Garbizi's called a simple play to go wide, but the freshly Italian Taviar gets them to go forward as Sebastian Negri begins to line himself up with his hole. Garbizi, however, tells him to take a step wider, anticipating the hole will shift and open after he takes the ball and space will open elsewhere. And you know what? He's right. Garbizi jogs into position, expecting this blockbuster carry from his flanker, telling Brex to run the wrap around here, but it was only ever a decoy. He drops it onto his boot and it bounces perfectly for Monty Yohan, who rides the tackle and offloads to Lamro on hand, as ever, to score the try. This cross kick is perfect, but it's Garbizi's ability to anticipate a defence that makes this world class. Before he's even passed to Negri, he's glanced at the winger and then again after the carry, knowing exactly who he's looking to draw in whilst the ball is on the opposite touchline. We can see him similarly boss the opening few minutes here against England, dropping off a ball once to Lamro, sucking in defenders. Then, as they work right, Garbizi once again watching the far touchline and then points far side. He jogs round as Lamro, back up on his feet, generates super quick ball with an offload. Defenders taken out, Garbizi times and executes an incredibly crisp pass perfectly and Jacopo Trula can put Ioani in the corner. But as well as creating moments, he's equally happy to be patient and identify them. Here he sits back and because of his layback body language doesn't appear a threat at all until the ball is actually passed to him, at which point he bursts into life and uses the runner in front as a sort of opportunity to arc outside before giving the ball exactly as the last man turns his back on Eduardo Padovani out wide, allowing rugby's biggest radiohead fan to step inside and score. Even in their as yet undecided pattern last autumn, we saw Paolo play some incredibly controlled rugby. By the end of their final game against Uruguay, Garbizi was orchestrating very sudden switches in formation. During this play, Italy make 50 metres by changing from a 1-3-3-1 to a 1-3-2-2 formation on the fly, Michele Lamro drifting in the outside channel as Garbizi orders him. It's really sharp collective play that creates a huge amount of space on the fly, and when their minis age maestro isn't bossing things, Crowley's Benetton were very fond of an extra pass or two. Here, Negri takes a second to weigh up his options, and the defence, torn in the weight, take different options, but the flanker is alert enough to ignore the easy carry and give it to Hayward, who puts Ioani in the corner, his favourite place to be. I'd anticipate most of Italy's rugby to run through Garbizi as a membrane, but last year we saw a huge increase in the vision and game awareness of all his teammates, spotting when it's on without necessarily needing Paolo to tell them to pass it. However, an interesting addition to Six Nations is coming from the back. With Matteo Minotti injured, the only out-and-out fullback in Italy's squad is the aforementioned king of limbs himself, Eduardo Padovani. Now, as magical as Minotti can be, this could be a really interesting change for Italy, as it gives Garbisi something he's rarely had before, an alternate distributor. Whilst Carlo Canna technically played well in the 12 shirt, we shouldn't get caught up once again in facts. Canna had a habit of just taking over, of overruling Garbisi and doing his own thing, often to the movement of the team's detriment. 
But in Padavani, they have an alternate distributor. Prepare to say, OK, computer, and listen to Paolo, honey. We saw beats of this in the autumn. Padavani stepping in as an alternate playmaker here, or coming around the bend and organising the backs. What's got bees is occupied. I'll be curious to see if this adds an extra width or dimension to Ithi's game as old Droby Ipshamp rolls along. It's particularly intriguing because if there's one critique I'd level at Godbeezy's game after watching him closely for this, it's his lack of trust. If Paolo Godbeezy is calling a move, in literally every example I could find, he puts the most ambitious, difficult or flashy pass on himself. One of the things that set George Ford apart back when he was England 10 was he knew when to trust Farrell or Daly to throw the tricky passes, whereas Paolo's focus on himself may give defence a chance to force hurried versions of those trickier balls. Having an expendable distributor like Padovani in the backline may allow Godbeezy to develop his selflessness in the coming campaign. And Padovani is actually something of an outlier in the like Beatley starting 15 for their first game against France, in that, far from being Kid A, at 28 he's one of the oldest in the team. The full 30-man squad contains two players who recently turned 30, and nobody older than them. Clocking in with an average age of just 23, the youngest in this year's edition of B Champs Ruggest Old Ship. And if you plug in injured teammates Matteo Minazzi, Jake Pelledri, and Marco Rizzioni, the team only gets younger still. What Italy now have is a group of players who have come through the finest academy teams Italy have ever produced, not just playing a higher standard of rugby than previous generations, but learning to win games in a bright blue shirt from an early age. Gone are players who knew nothing but losses in a jury. This is a generation who only have to remember how to win, not learn from scratch. However, that is likely going to take a bit of time. Looking at that likely team to play France, 10 of the starting 15 made the debuts after the 2019 World Cup, and with that younger side comes a curve as they adapt to the rigours of professional international rugby. Last year, Italy threw a huge number of players in at the deep end. Nine of the aforementioned 15 went into last year's Six Nations, having made fewer than 20 senior starts for their club. By comparison, the other real, you know, big name talked about youngster in this year's Six Nations, one Mr Marcus Smith, had played 79 games for Harlequins by the time he won his first cap for England. But the improvement we've seen in almost all of those Italian players, none more so than Lamar and Garbisi, suggests that this is a strategy that could work if they're a bit more patient. That said, I do worry that 2022 may be slightly, maybe a year too early for this Italy team to avoid another wooden spoon. But alongside the most talented crop they've had in some time, they have a coach who almost specialises in making underdogs lose by margins way below what was expected. 2022 might be the year people sit up and take notice of this young crop of Italian youngsters, where they push a few teams closer than perhaps expected, but they can't close it out. It's in the next few years that I think this group will start to hit their stride. Because this is an entire Italian union looking forward. New FIR president Maurizio Innocente has also put huge emphasis on youth, replacing four centralised academies with ten tied to the best senior clubs across the full country, recently broken an agreement as well with the Italian Football Union to share resources and get rugby introduced to thousands more schools across the country. And beyond players, Italy have a very interesting unit of coaches learning the trade at Benton. A hundred cap second row Marco Bortolami is heading up a team that includes former England defence coach Paul Gustard, legendary utility back Andrea Marzi, who spent five seasons learning his new craft at Wasps, and ex-international hooker Fabio Angaro. And it's hard to escape the idea this team is being groomed to take over in a few years' time and build towards 2027, when the bulk of this squad will be looking to peak. For decades, Italian rugby has looked only backwards, and it might as well, because, you know, in context, 12 wins in 22 years is not that bad. It's considerably better than France managed in their equivalent period. The French were added in 1910, but didn't win their 12th game until 1947, and wouldn't win the first championship until 1959, almost 50 years after joining. For the first time, I feel as though Italy are looking forward to the day they one day do the same. Not reminiscing over the days of Diego, memories of Martin, the souvenirs of Sergi. Oh. Okay, they even put him on the... They even put him front and centre on the poster. Okay, fine. let's call... Let's call that one an anomaly. This is an Italian team looking forward, aiming to beat France's record of taking their first title in their 49th year. This is an Italian team that dreams not of coming fifth, but of one day winning the Six Nations. The images we all imagine when thinking of Italian rugby could all be very well about to change. Thanks for watching that. We're very almost at Six Nations time. Once again, it comes around so fast. The competition obviously starts in less than a week. Uh, between now and then, I will be doing a preview that kind of covers all of the teams. Um, we'll talk about some, you know, a talking point from each nation. Uh, that's coming up on likely Thursday, possibly Friday. We'll see how things go. Uh, so I'll see you 
then for that, I've also got the Rugby World Cup podcast I've been doing. Um, we've got loads of episodes coming up. We've been kind of stockpiling them ahead of the Six Nations. So there's loads of those coming up. If you want to discover your new favourite Fijian fullback, go and listen to the episode from last Friday. Um, there's loads more happening. Loads more going on around. Just a video on Rugby 22 if you want to have a look at that. Plenty of stuff, plenty of stuff. But I'll see you very soon for more Six Nations nonsense.